Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to our sixth live moon tour in this series. I did want to let everybody know that uh, unlike most of these that we do, we're not doing this one in, in pairs this time. We're only doing a single one uh, tonight, and that's because we are preparing, making plans uh, about how we're going to operate our star parties once we reopen here at the Visitor Center. Now, we don't yet know when we're going to open. We will not do that until it is safe to do so, certainly. Uh, but nonetheless, this uh, type of thing does require planning. And given that a lot of our staff, including myself, are busy with preparations and doing some trial runs on our star parties, the different way in which we will do them once we restart, uh, it has everybody a little, little busier than normal. So we're only gonna be doing one just tonight. And then the window for the next series of moon tours opens up around uh, August 23rd or so. And as soon as we have a date or some dates in late August to do some more moon tours, uh, we will definitely post that on social media. We'll also have uh, a little thing on our website calendar and on our live stream page on the mcdonaldobservatory.org website. That's our website here at the Visitor Center. And again, I wanted to welcome all of our viewers tonight. I noticed uh, before I got on the stream here that we had more waiting tonight, I think, than we've had for any other moon tour so far. So thank you all very much for joining us tonight uh, for our moon tour. Now, we do have some clouds outside. It's, it, we had the kind of cloud cover today that we do typically have during our uh, high pressure uh, summer days when we get the big cumulus clouds forming up around noon. And we have a few lingering bits of those cumulus clouds around, but I'm not terribly worried uh, that they, they are going to interfere with our program tonight. Now, of course, we are coming to you tonight live from McDonald Observatory. We are part of the University of Texas at Austin, uh, but we are not located on nor anywhere near the main campus at UT. We're about 450 miles west of the main campus of the University of Texas out here in the beautiful uh, mountains of, of uh, West Texas. I'll show you a picture where we are here in a minute. Uh, I did want to remind everybody watching tonight to not wait until the end to submit your questions over in the chat window on the right. Uh, we do have moderators watching the stream during the entire program tonight. Ask your questions of our moderators. They will uh, do their best to get to your questions. And uh, they will also save a few of those questions for me at the end. So during the very last part of our program tonight, as always, uh, we will be, I will be addressing some of your questions for tonight. And as always, I did want to show everybody where I'm located. Uh, this is the summit of Mount Locke, which is at an elevation of 6,791 feet. The road that leads up to the summit there is the highest point on the Texas highway system at almost 6,800 feet above sea level. The two domes you see on the summit there, the one on the left, that's our original telescope, the 82-inch Otto Struve telescope. And to its right is the 107-inch Harlan J. Smith telescope. Uh, those were number two and number three, respectively, in the world when they were brand new. Uh, beyond those two on the summit of Mount Locke, there's another peak beyond them. Uh, that is Mount Folks, on which is located the 394-inch, that's 10-meter, Hobby Eberly Telescope, which, at least during part of the pandemic since March, has uh, been the, only, the largest telescope on the Earth still in operation and doing research. So those are the summits of our, of our location here. Also wanted to show you, as always, where I am located. Uh, the building that you see there is the Frank N. Bash Visitor Center. Out behind the Visitor Center, you can see three domes. I'm in the one on the far left circled in yellow. Out behind the Visitor Center is the beautiful amphitheater where we normally begin our star parties and do constellation tours out front of that building. I don't know if you can see it there. Uh, we do have a sundial out there and it tells us the time plus or minus 15 or 20 minutes depending on the time of year and uh, other factors. So we have a beautiful facility here. We are definitely looking forward to reopening it when we can. Uh, as always, I wanted to give you an overview of our program tonight. We're going to be discussing uh, a lot of different things. And again, be sure you ask your questions during the stream. We're doing the introduction at this time. I'm going to show you the equipment we're using this evening. 
Uh, speaking of equipment, I have a fancy new mic, headset mic here that I hope is, is giving you a better audio experience than the earbuds I've used on, on prior programs. Uh, we're going to talk about the equipment we use tonight, our telescopes and cameras. We're going to do a quick view of the moon's major features, the things that you would see on the moon if you had a pair of binoculars or a very small telescope looking up at the moon. Our discussion section uh, tonight, we're going to cover two things. We're going to first talk about lunar phases. And if you joined us for our very first program, which I believe was May 3rd, we did talk about lunar phases. We have not really talked about lunar phases at all since then. And so we're going to reprise that topic and uh, cover lunar phases again for those of you who did not get to see the, the um, earlier program. Going to fill in our discussion section with, with a discussion about lunar eclipses. Then we're going to go to our high power views of the moon through our big telescope. We'll do some Q&A at the end and uh, we'll wrap up the show tonight. And again, thank you all for being with us tonight. We do depend on your support. Now, this is a picture of the dome in which I am located. You can see in the background there that is Mount Folks, on top of which is the 10-meter Hobby Eberly Telescope. Uh, that is more or less the way the skies looked at program start time tonight, just a few clouds drifting around. Uh, the equipment that we're using tonight, as always, we're giving you two different views of the moon. Uh, the wide field view of the moon, where we'll see the whole moon in one field of view, is a three inch telescope and you can actually see it. It's right here. It's the white tube telescope. That is a three inch Teleview 76 short focus refracting telescope, an apochromatic short focus telescope. To get our close up views of the moon tonight, you can see just the back end right here of our 16 inch telescope. This is an F9 uh, RC system. And if you look on the back in the picture there, look on the back of each of the telescopes, you can see small devices with cables coming out of them. Those are the cameras that we're using to image the moon tonight. And we use a different camera for each view of the moon, a two megapixel and a three megapixel version, sorry, five megapixel version of uh, a line of cameras that were manufactured by a company no longer in existence called Point Grey Research. And certainly it's great to have telescopes and cameras, but honestly, we couldn't do this program without a mount. The mount not only allows the telescope to be moved to different parts of the sky, but it also allows for tracking to occur as the Earth is spinning, of course. You go out in the morning, you see the sun rise. You go out in the evening, you see the sun set. Uh, the sun is, is not really the thing that's moving, of course. It is the Earth that's spinning. And this mount called a Paramount ME, made by a company called Software Bisque, uh, this company makes the mount that allows that tracking to happen. Now, this is the point in the program where I always mention um, something to the effect of, well, you know, you don't need a telescope that costs tens of thousands of dollars to get a great view of the moon. And I've shown you a variety of my telescopes that I've used to look at the moon. Last time we talked about how you can get a great view of the moon with just plain old pair of binoculars. Um, in general, if you're looking for a good beginning telescope, there's a type of telescope called a Dobsonian. Now, that, the name there, Dobsonian, is, is an homage to John Dobson. He was a very, very famous amateur astronomer and really revolutionized the, the way in which large telescopes can be made inexpensively and, and can provide a lot of viewing pleasure for not a lot of money. And Dobsonians over the years have really caught on. And they're some of my favorites because they're, they don't cost a lot of money. When you buy a Dobsonian telescope, the money that you're putting in it is mostly for the optics. It's not for an elaborate mounting system. Uh, they're generally pretty easy to move around, easy to set up. Basically, you just carry it out and set it up and you know put it on the ground, pop an eyepiece in, and you're basically ready to go. So they're very user-friendly. Now, they do have a few... Uh, cons, I guess if you can call them cons, uh, they won't find things automatically for you. There's, there's a type of telescope called a go-to telescope, which at least in principle can locate objects for you if it's set up properly. Uh, we don't generally recommend this type of telescope to somebody just starting out because not only do they cost more because of the, the motors and the computer system, but a lot of times they don't find things very accurately. 
And so, you know, really, if you're just primarily going to look at the moon and planets, you don't, you don't need that. You can see the moon, you can see the planets in the sky, and it's easy enough to get the telescope pointed there, you know, without any help from a computer. Uh, they don't track as the Earth spins, so you can't do astrophotography unless you are doing pretty much images of the moon because the moon is so bright, it requires a, a very short exposure and you don't need a, a time exposure, anything more than a few milliseconds. And so the uh, image of the moon is not going to move significantly across, across the field of view uh, during the typical exposure time for the moon. So there you go, Dobsonian. Now that one shown there is one very similar to what we sell uh, sold, we'll sell again, hopefully when we reopen in our gift shop here at the observatory. It's made by a company called Orion Telescopes. That's their eight inch model. And it's really a nice telescope. Okay. Now I want to show you the moon and I'm looking at my monitor here and assuming that is not a frozen image, it looks like we have a cloud free view of the moon. So let me bring that moon up there for you. Now this is what we call the low power view of the moon, low magnification view of the moon, because, well, you're looking at it at such a low power, generally you can see the whole thing in, in one shot. When we get to the high power views in a little bit, we'll be zoomed in on one very small region of the moon. But I always really appreciate the view of the moon like this, where you can see the whole thing and it's really super sharp because you're not magnifying the turbulence in the atmosphere as much. So certainly a low view, the power view of the moon gives a really nice, uh, pleasing image. I want to bring up a little pointer here because I did want to point out a few things that you've likely already noticed. In particular, the big dark patches on the moon, like this one over here called the Sea of Crises. This one over here called the Sea of Fertility. We have the Sea of Tranquility right up here. We have the Sea of Nectar. Right down there, we have the Sea of Clouds. We're going to investigate some areas down there near the Sea of Clouds. And we're seeing half, about half, of a big, big, the largest one of these seas on the moon that's called the Sea of Rains. Now, they're, they're not called seas because they contain water. But before we had telescopes, people would look up at the moon and it, it was impossible to tell that they were not bodies of water. And there was certainly contrast between them and the rest of the moon. And so they, they got the name seas, but even after we found out they weren't filled with water, you know, the name had, had, been, had stuck. It had been used for so many years that people just kind of didn't want to change what they called it. Uh, they were ancient basaltic lava flows. Some of them are impact basins, kind of like a crater, just on a much larger scale, uh, most of which that happened very, very early in the moon's history. So we have a bunch of those dark patches. You've also noticed that we have several craters. The largest craters are seen particularly along this line. Notice how you see a bunch of craters down here in, in the southern lunar highlands. We'll get to that in a little bit. Uh-oh, are you seeing what I'm seeing? I'm seeing some clouds beginning to cover up the moon. So that's how you know, folks, that is a live view of the moon because we have a live cloud right now covering up the moon. I guess I shouldn't have said anything about the sea of clouds because as soon as I did that, well, in they came and covered up the moon. We'll give it a second. Um, think back to what it looked like. In fact, you don't have to do that. I have a little trick I can do right here. I'm always ready in case we have cloudy skies, and we have momentarily cloudy skies. It'll get better in a minute. So this is pretty much like the view we had earlier. This technically is a simulated view from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. But look along this line. That's the line that we call the Terminator, and it is where, for a waxing moon, the sun is rising. And so if you were standing along that Terminator, anywhere along the Terminator, you would see your shadow extending out behind you facing the rising sun to the east. And so those crater rims and the mountains and any little bump that sticks up on the moon really shows up a lot better when it is being struck by a low angle of incoming sunlight. It really tends to bring out terrain features when the sunlight angle is coming in almost parallel to the horizon. Let's go back over and see if we have that live view. We don't, 
but that's okay because it's time for us to go to our discussion session and we will come back certainly and look at the moon some more in our high power views in just a little bit. Let's go back to our slides. Now this is the moon facts slide that I put up. Let me get that arrow off my chest. That is the moon facts slide that we have up during every program, just listing some of the basic stats about the moon. You can always go back and review those later. Let's have a, a discussion about lunar phases. There's, there's all kinds of different shapes that you can see the moon in at one time or another. And we define the beginning of the lunar cycle with the new moon phase, which is the moon that you don't see. You never see the new moon because it's completely backlit at that time. The sunlight is illuminating the far side of the moon at new moon, not the earth facing side. And so we cannot see any of it. But just a few days after new moon over in the west, you would notice the crescent moon, very slender at first, but growing over about a week and ending the, at the top row, end of the far right top picture there is what we call the first quarter moon. We had that moon just a couple of nights ago. And then for a week or so, the moon is in sort of an egg shape like tonight that we call the gibbous phases of the moon. And by the way, the yellow circled phase is the phase that we have tonight. At the end of the second week, more or less, of the lunar cycle, we have the full moon, the big bright moon, where the entire Earth-facing side is lit up at that time. And by the way, that is the worst time to look at the moon with a telescope. Because remember, you need those shadows to be able to see the craters and the mountains and the valleys and all those things. And at full moon, the light, sunlight is coming straight down and filling up all those features. The third week after full, the moon begins to wane. The amount of the illuminated surface decreases for the next two weeks, for the first week being, again, the gibbous moon, ending up at the last quarter moon, and then ending up as a decreasingly wide crescent shape, and then back to new moon. And that time period from new moon to the next new moon is called the synodic month, synodic month, 29 and a half days. Now let's talk about why the moon goes through phases. We've all noticed, you know, you go out on a given random night, you see the moon up in the sky, or sometimes you see it up in the daytime sky, and it's a different shape every time you see it. And everybody knows that, but now let's talk about why the moon does this. The graphic on the screen there shows the Earth and the moon and the moon's orbit around the Earth. The Earth and the moon their sizes are to scale in this graphic, not their distances, but their sizes are to scale. Sunlight is coming in from the right side of the screen, lighting up the right side of the Earth, the right side of the moon. That will not change during our demonstration. Where it says from Earth down below there, that is the phase that you would see, the lunar phase that would be visible given the moon's position that you see over there on the right. So we're starting at new moon, and it takes about a week to go from new moon to what we call first quarter. The angle between the sun and the earth and the first quarter moon is about 90 degrees. And so we look up more or less tonight, we see the first quarter moon. The uh, sun facing side, in this case, if you're in the northern hemisphere, at least facing south, it's the right side of the moon that's lit up and we see that corresponding phase over there on the left. About another week goes by to go from first quarter to full moon, where the moon is now opposite the sun in our sky, giving us that view of the hemisphere facing the Earth. The entire lunar hemisphere is illuminated by the sun only at full moon. Then it takes about another week to go from full moon to what we call third or last quarter. It's the half moon. Just like we saw it first quarter, we see the half moon at third quarter. It's just the western half of the moon instead of the eastern half of the moon. And then you can guess what's going to happen next. It takes about another week to go from third quarter back to new, and that is our 29 and a half day synodic month. So the reason the moon goes through phases is two things. The moon is always lit up halfway by the sun. You saw that there in the graphic. 
no matter what the moon's position around the Earth, half the moon was always lit up. The thing is, it's not the same half all the time, right? Because the moon rotates one time as it orbits around the Earth one time. And so as the moon orbits around the Earth, we see that lit side from different points of view, different angles, and that is what produces the lunar phases. All right, now let's talk about something else that I'm betting a lot of you have seen before. In this graphic, we have the Earth in the middle again, the moon, and the moon's orbit around the Earth there in white. The sun is understood to be way over to the right side of the screen somewhere. You can see the shadows of both the Earth and the moon extending out into space. So that's our setup. That's what we're looking at right now. If the moon is in a certain position opposite the sun, so that would be at full moon, it looks like that right there could be a lunar eclipse, right? Because it looks like, to me, from this point of view, that the moon is sitting inside the shadow of the Earth. The Earth is blocking all the sunlight from reaching the moon. But now let's look at this from a little bit different point of view where we're gonna tip down and see the orbit from the side. So that is not in fact a lunar eclipse because clearly you can see there the moon is not in the Earth's shadow. Let's let it go around a few more times. Let's let the moon orbit the Earth a few more times, a few more months, and eventually the proper alignment will occur. Now, have you noticed, everyone watching tonight, have you noticed that we don't have a lunar eclipse every month? We also don't have a solar eclipse every month. And I'm really kind of glad that we don't because they would be a lot less special if we had them every month. The reason why we don't have solar and lunar eclipses every month is because the plane of that orbit that you're seeing in the graphic right there, the plane of the moon's orbit around the Earth is not the same plane as the Earth's orbit around the sun. They're, they're askew a little bit. And that means that you do need a certain alignment to produce a solar and a lunar eclipse. But now if that alignment exists to have a lunar eclipse, it still exists two weeks after or two weeks before, meaning that these eclipses come in pairs. If we have a lunar eclipse tonight, which would be pretty odd given that we don't have a full moon, then we either had a solar eclipse two weeks ago or we're going to have a solar eclipse in about another two weeks. So they do come in pairs like that, but they do need a special alignment for that to be possible. So what does a lunar eclipse look like? Well, most of you have probably seen one, right? They're not that hard to see. It's not like a solar eclipse where you have to be in a very special place at a very special time a lunar eclipse is basically visible from an entire hemisphere of the Earth at one time. So really the only thing that's required is that you have a lunar eclipse happening and you be on the right side of the Earth to be able to see the moon above your local horizon. Now I shot this one. This was the last lunar eclipse that we had. Well, I should say the last sort of major lunar eclipse that we had a little over a year ago, January 20th of 2019, and I shot this from my backyard. The next lunar eclipse that we, that we will have, visible from North America at least, will be a few more years, a little bit less than, than two years now. May 15th, 2022 is the next total lunar eclipse visible from most parts of North America. So put that on your calendar. Hope, hopefully we'll have a clear night for that. Hope, I don't know what day of the week that is, but hopefully we'll be open again by then and that will be a star party night and everybody in attendance will be able to enjoy that with us. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm looking up because I can actually see where the moon is supposed to be and we have clouds right now. So what I'm gonna do for you, until I can see that moon pop out, we're gonna go to our simulated view of the moon and let me get that back up here where I can see it. We're gonna tour it in simulated mode, at least until we have a clear shot of the moon and it's sort of trying to peek out right now, but it's in between two clouds. So we're gonna, we're gonna stick with this simulated view of the moon. And we're gonna start up here in the Northern hemisphere of the moon. Let me get centered up on the area that I wanna show you. That's pretty much where we need to be, right 
in there. All righty. I'm keeping an eye on the moon for you. As soon as it pops out, I'll put the live view back up here for you. But we're, we're getting our live view tonight in the lunar northern hemisphere, and the many features visible in our first view represent a great variety of lunar landforms. This view includes the northeastern portion of the Sea of Rains, also known as Mare Imbrium, and its related impact basin known as the Imbrium Basin. Now, the, the Imbrium Basin, Mare Imbrium, is the second largest expanse of lunar volcanism after another big one called the Ocean of Storms, which is to the southwest of our current view and still in lunar nighttime. The Imbrium Basin was formed about 3.85 billion years ago when an asteroid struck the lunar surface. And the actual size of that asteroid is not known, but a recent paper suggested a, di a diameter of about 150 miles. Many separate lava flows have been identified in Mare Imbrium, and they've been identified as being separate lava flows by their unique spectral signatures. In the northeastern portion of our view right now, we have two large impact craters known as Aristoteles and Eudoxus. This is Aristoteles right up here. This is Eudoxus. And hey, I'm seeing the real live moon, so let's go back to that view. Now I'm going to need to switch cameras here on you. We still have our low power view of the moon up there, so I'm gonna take that away for just a moment. I'll bring it right back to our high power view. Everybody keep your fingers crossed that we'll continue to have some good clear moon viewing weather here for the next little bit. Now we're going to move the telescope. Let's go a little faster. We're gonna move up to try to match that view that we had in the simulated view. You do have to have a lot of patience if you want to do astronomy, because sometimes it's clear, but sometimes it's not. Okay, well, we have arrived back in our live view at this point, and we were talking about the craters, Aristoteles and Eudoxus down here. Now, Aristoteles is the larger of the two and before i forget here let me make sure i set our lunar tracking rates so that we track on the moon not on some stars aristoteles up there is the larger of the pair and it spans 54 miles its terraced walls descend 2.2 miles to a relatively flat floor broken by a few scattered hills and you can see those right in the center of the crater just some small hills there on the bottom the faintly visible raised area surrounding the crater is composed of pulverized and partially melted rocks that form a raised mound known as an ejecta blanket. Southwest of, our, of Aristoteles, we have the crater Eudoxus. That's the one right here. It's 42 miles wide and 2.7 miles deep. Now, did y'all notice the mountains that we have in this view? I certainly did. They are beautiful. And I'm going to make a little adjustment to our camera to maybe brighten up that scene just a little bit. There we go. Now the two mountain ranges that we have to show you tonight are the lunar Caucasus, which is this group over here, and the lunar Alps, which is this group of mountains right over here. Now the Caucasus mountains form a wedge-shaped range that runs north to south for nearly 300 miles. Ascending from the lava plains of the Sea of Rains over here to the highest point in the Caucasus Range involves an elevation change of about 18,000 feet above sea level. West of the Caucasus over here, we find the Lunar Alps. This range stretches for about 175 miles and forms the northern margin of the Sea of Rains. So down here is the Sea of Rains the Alps formed the northern margin of that big impact basin. The highest elevations in the lunar Alps are about 8,000 feet, so not nearly as tall as the Caucasus. Lunar mountain ranges, by the way, are formed on the moon as a result of large impacts and are frequently named after ranges on the Earth, which are formed in a very different manner. Did you all notice this gouge right here? This, uh, it, it looks like, um, you know, some sort of missile came in at a low, low approach angle and sort of cut its way through the Alps there. 
that gouge is called the Alpine Valley. And I want to show you, I think we've shown you this before, but I definitely wanted to show it to you again. Uh, this is a view created from, from Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter data. If you want to learn more about the LRO spacecraft, please watch our moon tour for May the 29th. This valley, the Alpine Valley, is a type of structural feature known as a graben. The floor of this 96-mile-long valley has dropped down with respect to the surrounding landscape. The change in elevation from the Alpine Valley floor to the highest peaks in the Alps is more than 13,000 feet. That's pretty cool. I love that view, just looking right down the Alpine Valley. We still have a good clear moon for you. All right. Let's see, looking near the northwestern part of our view, you've already noticed it right over here, I'm sure, your eyes are immediately drawn to the dark flat floor of the crater that we call Plato. Measuring 63 miles across and 1.3 miles deep, Plato was once much, much deeper than it is today. About 2.8 billion years ago, lava began to invade through the crater floor and fill it up nearly to its rim. Notice the shadows. I really like these. Can you all see those right there? Notice those shadows that are stretching across the floor of Plato. Those are about 6,500 feet above the floor, and that's about the same elevation as Mount Locke, where I am located right now. Down here, this scattered group of mountains, in fact, let me jog the telescope over to the west just a little bit so you can see all of them there. This little group of mountains down here just south, southwest of Plato, those are known as the Tenerife Mountains. And they consist of just a scattered chain covering about 110 miles across the moon's surface with peaks approaching about 8,000 feet. And moving a little eastward of the Tenerife Mountains, we see the Twin Peaks. This is Pico, about 8,000 feet, and Piton, right down here, which is about 7,500 feet. And I've always liked how these mountains contrast with the very smooth, very dark, flat floor of the Sea of Rains. Now, located between the Alps and the Caucasus, there's another crater right here. This is known as a flooded crater. It's about 35 miles wide and it's called Cassini. The rim and the outer ramparts around this crater are all that's left. Two more recent impacts created additional craters though within the rim of Cassini and these are known as Cassini A and B. It's that little crater right there and the somewhat larger crater right up there. Cassini A and Cassini B. They do that I guess just so they didn't have to come up with new names for craters. Pretty cool. Now, before we proceed to the next view, and I just realized I need to get it back in there a little bit for you right there. Look at the crater right down here at the bottom of our view. This one is known as Aristillus. And shockingly, this one is not named for the Norwegian boy band of the same name, but rather for an ancient Greek astronomer, Aristillus. Now, west of Aristillus is another group of isolated peaks known as the Spitsbergen Mountains, and you can see those just right here, just a little isolated chain of mountains. Okay, it is time for us to proceed to our second field of view. And so what I'm going to do now is move this gigantic 16-inch telescope over here. We're going to move southward and we want that big crater right at the top center of our view. And we want the other crater down at the very bottom to be just right about there. All right, now let me set our lunar tracking rates again. As we've now moved southward down the lunar terminator, get rid of my pointer there for you, uh, we're seeing one of my favorite portions of the moon, which includes one of the most extensive mountain ranges and perhaps the most photogenic Apollo landing site. The crater Archimedes, let me get my pointer back on. This is Archimedes up here. It's about 50 miles wide, making it the largest crater in the Sea of Rains. As with the crater Plato that we saw in the previous view, the floor of Archimedes has been flooded and filled with lava. 
Only the rim survives, and the central peak, common in most craters this size, has been completely submerged. Just south of Archimedes is another scattered group of mountains known appropriately as the Archimedes Mountains, with the tallest peaks being about a mile and a half. Now, my favorite thing in this view is this immense mountain range over here. I'm sure you noticed it. These are what we know as the Apennine Mountains, named after the Italian range on the Earth. And I want to show you a cool view again from the LRO, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. As we can see in this view, these mountains form the southeastern boundary of the Sea of Rains. This arcing chain includes several peaks taller than two miles in elevation. These include Mount Bradley, Mount Hadley, Mount Ampere, and Mount Huygens, often cited as the tallest mountain on the moon at about 18,000 feet. That's pretty cool. Let's go back to our live view of the moon, which luckily we still have. If we follow the Apennine mountain range as it curves to the southwest and begins to peter out down here, we encounter the crater Eratosthenes, named after the ancient Greek astronomer who first measured the size of planet Earth. I'm going to make try to make that a little more visible for you down there. Eratosthenes. It is 36 miles wide and about two miles deep. It sits on top of the Apennine Mountains, so we know that it formed after the Imbrium impact event that formed the Sea of Rains. There's a series of small central peaks on the crater floor that are up to about three quarters of a mile tall. Now these central peaks, we also saw those in uh, Eudoxus Crater up in the northern part of the moon. These peaks form in major impacts as the layers of rock under the crater floor rebound upward, forming peaks in just a matter of minutes. Hey, we got a pretty good wind gust through here. Did you see the moon jump around there? There was a wind gust coming into our dome. Now, we do have two Apollo landing sites to show you tonight. We're going to begin with Apollo 15, which on our live view of the moon landed on the moon right about, and I need to move the telescope a little bit, it's drifting a little bit on us, so there we go. Move it back down to where it's supposed to be and set the tracking rates again. Apollo 15 landed right about in there. Now, Apollo 15 included astronauts David Scott and James Irwin that descended to the surface and landed near Hadley Rill on July the 30th, 1971, while Al Warden orbited overhead in the command module. This was the first mission to use the lunar rover to extend their exploration of the lunar surface. Three extravehicular activities, that's going outside your spacecraft and walking on the moon, spanning about 19 hours were accomplished during the nearly 67 hours that they spent on the lunar surface. Now in this picture right here, you see that mountain in the background? That is Mount Hadley. And that is basically visible. Let me show you here on the live view of the moon. Mount Hadley is that mountain right there at the tip of that arrow is Mount Hadley. All right, well, we're running a little late, real little long here, so we're going to try to make up some time. And I forgive me for not advancing our slides here on the left side. We're now going to continue southward along the Lunar Terminator. Let's do it as quickly as we can. Now I need to consult where on the moon I need to be. Okay, now I know that's gonna work out pretty well. And luckily we still have that live moon up there, so we're still in good shape here. I'm gonna keep y'all up a little bit later. Let's see, where are we? We want to be actually right about there. It's pretty close. That'll work. Okay, we've continued even further southward along the Terminator. We're now in the beginning of what's known as the Southern Lunar Highlands. Get rid of my arrow there. Here we see a landscape saturated with large, old, heavily eroded craters representing an early period of intense bombardment of the moon's surface. Some of the largest craters here bear the scars inflicted by grazing debris ejected during the formation of the Imbrium Basin that we talked about earlier. 
we have some major craters here I want to show you. We're going to start with this one right here, which is known as Ptolemaeus. Ptolemaeus is one and a half miles deep and 98 miles wide. Below it, we find another crater called Alphonsus. Alphonsus measured about, measures about 69 miles wide and is about one and a half uh, miles deep. Now I want to show you something really cool here. I just love this video. On March the 24th, 1965, NASA's Ranger 9 spacecraft televised 5,814 images in the last 19 minutes of its flight until the time of impact. Ranger 9 struck the floor of Alphonse's crater traveling at a speed of 6,000 miles an hour. Here comes the impact. You ready? Wow, that's pretty cool. I, I think I read somewhere that the resolution at the surface in that last frame was something like 12 or 16 inches or so. Just amazing. 60 mile wide crater Arzakel is the youngest of the four craters here along the Terminator this evening. We mentioned the Sea of Clouds over here earlier. The basin in which this sea rests is likely very old from a period in lunar history known as pre-Nectarian. However, the lava flows that later filled in the basin are younger from a time called the Imbrium and the Eratosthenian Ages. All right, now I was going to point out where Apollo 14 landed, but it turns out that's going to be really, really hard to see given the... Uh, position near the Terminator tonight. So to try to save some time, we're going to skip over Apollo 14. We did cover Apollo 14 in the June 30th program. So to get some more info about Apollo 14, please go back and watch the show from June 30th. That was our previous show to this one. Now we're going to travel down further south, heading further into the southern lunar highlands to show you some more features. I see something really cool there. I'm, I'm guessing you probably saw it already. Let me get our telescope set up just the way we need it to be here for you. Okay, right at the top center of our view is a feature which you might have noticed. It's called the straight wall or rupees recta. And what I'm talking about, of course, is this feature right here, the straight wall. This is just a normal fault that breaks the surface for about 80 miles and is about a third of a mile tall. Now, while it looks like a cliff, in reality, it only has a slope of about 21 degrees. Features like the straight wall here demonstrate that the angle of incoming sunlight on the moon is a very important determining factor in a feature's visibility. Some lunar features are only visible under specific lighting conditions. In this case, the straight wall is only visible from Earth for a few days in the month-long lunar cycle when the Terminator is nearby. Now quickly, I want to show you some craters in our field of view here, so a chain of very old craters. Purbach, Regio Montanus, and Walther, W-A-L-T-H-E-R, Walther right there. But my favorite in this region is right here. It's known as Delandra. It's a little bit ill-defined, but it is a very large crater known as Delandra. Let's see. There's nothing really particularly outstanding about those first three I showed you, but Delandra is the third largest crater on the moon's Earth-facing side at 141 miles across. Only Bailey Crater, which is on the night side of the moon right now, and Clavius, which we'll see in our next view, are larger. Now, Delandra has many craters that have intruded upon its territory in the last several billion years, including Walther, which we already pointed out right here, but also Lexel down here, right along the southern border of Delandra Crater. Contained within Delandra are several craters, including this one right here, curiously named Hell. Now, this crater was not named for the fabled destination of fire, brimstone, and eternal punishment. Rather, Hell Crater is named after Jesuit priest and Hungarian astronomer Maximilian Hell. Not to be confused with Swiss actor Maximilian Schell, 
who starred in, among many other things, the 1979 movie The Black Hole, which is a dreadful film which I recommend all of you watch during the pandemic because, let's face it, what else do you have to do? All right, well, we're going to do one final view of just two craters down along pretty much in the very thick of the southern lunar highlands. So let's get down there quickly. Just two craters to talk about down here. So this will be really fast, I promise. And then right after you're done watching the moon tour, make sure you go watch the black hole. Okay, let's see here. Uh, Tycho, which is near the top of our view. Show it to you here. And once again, set the right tracking rate so the moon doesn't drift out. Tycho is a prominent Copernican age crater, younger crater. Now, when seen closer to full moon, Tycho has an extensive system of bright lines leading away from it. These rays, as they're called, are composed of materials that were blasted out of the crater and deposited on the surrounding landscape. Crater rays are deposited around all craters, but as the surface ages, space weathering darkens their appearance and after about a billion years or so the rays just are gone they disappear they fade in with the rest of the of the material on the surface tycho's 54 miles wide and has a central peak which is about 1.5 miles tall and you can see that peak right right there just the top of tycho's central peak is catching the early morning sunlight and if you look very carefully right down there you can see the shadow of the tip of its central peak cast upon the western floor of that crater. Now ejecta, stuff that flew out in the formation of Tycho, ejecta from Tycho produced landslides at the Apollo 17 landing site, hundreds and hundreds of miles away. Space weathering exposure of rocks in the landslide yielded ages of 108 million years, thus dating Tycho indirectly. And our final crater to talk about tonight is down here called Clavius. Clavius. And again, I forgot to advance the slides there, but you, you probably figured that out. Uh, is a very old Nectarian Age crater, 152 miles wide, so wider than Delandre that we saw up there earlier. 152 miles wide and almost three miles deep. Now, for comparison, the drive from Georgetown to Waxahachie, Texas, is 156 miles. One of my favorite features of Clavius is a descending series of more recent craters arcing across its expansive floor. And you can see two of those fairly easily. Well, there's, a, there's one down here which is uh, known as Rutherford Crater. And then we have Clavius D and Clavius C. And if we had more sunlight, there would be another one over here and another one over here. Five an arc of five craters descending in size, moving away from Rutherford. That's just one of my favorite features of Clavius. And this concludes our live tour of the moon's features for this evening. And now it's time for me to at least attempt to answer some of your questions, which were provided to me by our stream moderators. So I'm just going to leave that image of the moon up there. And I'm going to take away the sidebar slides and put my image back up here. And then I want to pull up to see if we have any, any questions from folks. Let's see. Um, Proxima Centauri, that's a cool name. What is the name of the speaker? Did I, did I forget to tell you my name? I'm sorry. Well, it was at the bottom of, of that first view. Anyway, uh, my name is Kevin Mace, and I am definitely not a lunar scientist. I'm an amateur astronomer. I've been doing astronomy since I was about 14 or so. Uh, that's been a, a number of decades ago. I'm not going to say exactly how many. Um, but I pursued um, physics and astronomy and stuff like that in school. But I found that rather than doing research in astronomy, I had a lot more interest in doing public outreach and education. And I began that here at the uh, Visitor Center here at McDonald Observatory back in 1992 is when I first started here. So that my background is, is in math and physics, but I'm not a research scientist and, and really an amateur astronomer. And, and you know the moon is not my specialty. It's just something that I've learned to appreciate more. Um, you know, it's, it's just easier to observe than galaxies. 
Let's see. Um, uh, Maxery. I'm not sure I'm saying that name right. I, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm not. How were the mountains formed on the moon? Okay, asked when you were talking about the Alps. Yeah, the mountains on the moon, as it turns out, unlike mountains on the Earth, which at least can be formed by the intersection of plates, of tectonic plates on the Earth smashing together, or one going underneath another one and raising, raising up a, a mountain range. On the moon, mountains are formed by impacts. Impacts, I mean, even just a crater has a continuous ring of mountains all the way around the edge. And early impacts on the moon, structures that, that were formed called impact basins, like the Sea of Rains, do have those mountain ranges all along their periphery, like the Apennine Mountains, the Alps, the Caucasus. Those are all mountains on the moon that were formed as a result of impacts on the moon a very, very long time ago. Let's see. Um, ASM, or ASM, says, could the astronauts see the stars and other planets when they were on the moon? Absolutely. Now, planets, I, I'm not sure about planets. They would have had to be above their local horizon, just as planets that you see tonight, Jupiter and Saturn, are in the southern sky this evening. They do have to be above your local horizon before you could see them. But certainly they could have been visible to the astronauts on the moon and the stars, absolutely. In fact, did you know that if you were on the moon, you could see the stars and the sun at the same time? because on the moon there's no atmosphere to scatter the sunlight around and make the sky bright. The sky would be dark and you could see the stars and the planets at the same time as the sun. All right, uh, our final question tonight that we have, Austin, Texas 1193 says, how are the ages of craters determined? Well, if you're talking about absolute ages, like I, I think I mentioned that um, the Crater Tycho was about 108 million years old. We only know that in the case of Tycho because the Apollo 17 astronauts noted areas on the mountains near where they landed which were, were hit, were smacked by ejecta, by stuff flying out of Tycho Crater when it was hit. And that flying debris caused landslides on the sides of the mountains that they landed near. And given how long those exposed rocks and the landslides had been exposed to, to the sunlight and to cosmic rays and things like that, they can tell roughly at least how old those features were. For other craters where we have di directly collected rocks that were formed during the impact, where this rock was, was created of melted material, it re-solidified, it reset the clock on that rock, we can know the ages of those impact structures because of astronauts going to the moon, collecting that stuff, bringing it back to the Earth, and subjecting it to radioisotope dating here on the Earth. So, but we don't know that for most of the craters on the moon. Uh, only for areas where we, we were able to physically collect and bring back material from those impact sites. Well, we've gone a little over time, and I do apologize for that, everybody. We, we had some weather issues early on, but it cleared up beautifully. We made it through the program. As always, I did want to point out that there are a number of resources where you can go and learn more about the moon. You can always come back and watch this again later to get all these links. And rather than go any longer tonight, I wanted to, of course, thank everybody again for joining us this evening. Again, keep an eye on our social media channels and our website for information about when we will reopen. And thank you again, everybody, for attending our program tonight. End of August-ish is the next time when we're going to be able to do a moon tour. So stay tuned for that. And I hope everybody had a great experience tonight. Go out and look at the moon. I can see it right now. Enjoy it on your own, and I'll see you next month. Good night, everybody.
Y'all still there? Yeah. 